Yes, thank you for being here. Please don't start my time because uh, I'm not ready with the slides. And uh, you can just a bit of correction, up, it's not IVOS. I, have, I, I like IVOS, but I like OCT a little bit more. And, and because uh, we're having this discussion, this is off record, and uh, what do you trust more? And I trust more what I can interpret more easily. And I personally can interpret OCT more easily, and that's why I use it the most. Uh, <clears throat> so, but today I will talk to you about a little bit because it's a very large argument about FFR, non-hyperemic pressure ratios, and a and and a uh, revascularization uh, indications and the, where we are and where are we going. So. You know, we do PCI since in the late 70s where Grunzig invented the balloon and opened the way for us to become interventional cardiologists. There are millions of us, uh, sorry, millions of PCIs done worldwide and there is an army of intervention cardiologists. But then studies like this come and put a bit our existence in question showing that what we do actually has no sense and that it could be done also with medications. So. Not even that, but we have some guidelines saying that we should use uh, ischemia guided and the FFR in this case and the IFR. But then again, there also there has been negative trials that spur debate over the technology role. So the cornerstones of our current revascularization strategy are being put in doubt. And we are in a crossroad between the Oh, I should talk closer. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, we are in a crossroad between uh, cabbage, uh, anatomy, morphology, functional, and uh, PCI or ischemia. So, the question is now, are these statements correct, and is it maybe time to think our revascularization strategy? As you know, we have now imaging, uh, we have FFR, we have diastolic, which to follow and what are their worth. So let me put it first this way. The concept of ischemia, ischemia guided treatment, does it still have a role in the light of the evidence? Because I'm saying these trials that came, my group in Zwolle, I was working in the Netherlands before, we were the first one because we're using it a lot to see also the failures of it. So we look retrospectively first to the data and we took diabetic patients. And in these diabetic patients we come, we look to the, those who had complete revascularization versus those who had at least one FFR left beyond. And we found that actually, strange enough, those who had one FFR left beyond in this diabetic population did worse, and not only in revascularization, but also death and MI. And then we had the ischemia trial that came and also showed that probably the ischemia-guided revascularization did not help much, at least in stable angina. And then we had also in acute coronary syndromes, the flower MI, well, after the different trials that said that the non-culprit should be treated with a ischemia guided, also this one shows that it does not work. And uh, it's not that it does not work, but that you could done the same with angiography. So my first question is, are we not asking too much from this concept of ischemia? And Actually, it came from the deferred trial. And what it exactly says, if you look to this paper, says that in patients with a coronary stenosis where you don't know if you have not done ischemia tests before and it's in your table, you could do this by using FFR. And he could identify those who benefit from PCI, or in other words, tell you that if the FFR is negative, you could also leave those people on medication. But this was for single vessel. And the concept did never took off once you're using it on single vessel. It took off when you're using it in multivessel with the FAME trial, which said that PCI treatment can localize the lesions that are practically causing you symptoms and get similar results by instead of all lesions. So the concept works perfectly as long as the treatment purpose is to reduce angina. If we want to reduce hard endpoints like death and MI, that's not enough. It's not made for. And then we had, after the FFR, we had the diastolic uh, measurements. And we know that already from, from the beginning that there are diastolic, uh, uh, diastolic uh, uh, sorry, diagnostic accuracy is less than that of FFR with about 15%. But we had New England Journal papers saying that it's non-inferior. 
let me just, if I look to these papers, I look to this non-inferiority, and what can be worse? If you're saying not inferior, first of all, you're not saying that it's equal. Uh, and the worst thing that can happen to you is that you have a false negative, and that is an ischemic lesion judged negative, which could eventually give you events. What is the chance of that? We know that from the FAME trial, 20%. These are those who were medical FFR positive treated medically. So, simple calculation. The chance of event that can originate from this 20% of patients of, uh, between the difference from FFR and IFR, which is only 15% in accuracy, and calculating that you have also false positive and false negatives, so the total chance of events that could come on top of it is 1.5. So you could look two ways on it. If you look to the non-inferiority margin used for defaint flare, it's 3.4, so you already knew before you run the trial that you are gonna be within that margin. The question is, is it good enough to be accepted? Probably yes, it's not a big deal, 1.5. We have seen trials, but it's up to what you want to, how you want to interpret it. And this is what they do on the IFR for the ones that just took the diastolic DPD, uh, DP, uh, PAPD, and they took the off 25% initial and then five milliseconds after. But there are at least other seven or eight possible candidates to do that, of which one is just simple PDPA. That is what you measure initially when you do FFR. And if you do look to the correlation of this, is equal. It's equal and very equal. If you look to the rock curves of those compared to FFR, is equal. If you look to diagnostic accuracy versus FFR, it's lower. And is equal between all these diastolics. So this is where we are with resting physiology, and as I said, it's a little bit less accurate, but it's non-inferior. And then we have also angiography now. We have QFR, also interesting, also non-inferior, but the whole process started with the physiology. We started with the concept that angiography evaluation is far from physiologic response produced from hyperemia, and now we end up again in angiography. <laughs> so we are turning on cycles while people are saying that what we're doing doesn't help a lot at all. So I'm gonna tell you why it doesn't help at all. Why is this? Why can we not reduce our endpoints? Because we need to look to what causes the disease. And the disease, you know, all of you know, starts from a plaque rupture that becomes vulnerable, ruptures, and it presents as an acute coronary syndrome or comes completely unobserved. You just go through it, you don't notice it. And by healing, it will start giving you either stable or crescendo angina. And these are the lesions where we'll eventually go and do FFR by. And the, you know that when you do FFR, two thirds will be negative. Please keep in mind that also one third of people who come with a myocardial infarction never had chest pain before. And that there are 10% of people who had myocardial infarction, they go through it and they also don't feel the thing apart from being a little bit tired that day. And the other question is, should we still wait for symptoms when we know that it's actually this rupture and healing of vulnerable plaque that is the main trigger of coronary disease progression? So what is the important question now? What is the percentage of vulnerable plaque in these FFR negative lesions and what is the percentage of vulnerable plaques in the FFR positive lesions? Why this question? Because if we're treating ischemia guided and we're treating all FFR positive, you need to know how much you're leaving beyond. So let's look to that and it's a good study that the, the colleagues from Japan and from uh, Korea have done together. They took on CT, looked to vulnerable plaque on CT, which is pretty much accurate. Let's not discuss about that, but look to the actual values that we see here. So please look to this number. As I said to you, one third was negative, two thirds were negative, one third was positive. That's what's the OCT. Now, how much in this OCT positive and OCT negative were vulnerable plaques? And you could see it presented there. And the columns, the blue, uh, the blue part of the columns is where the vulnerable plaque is. And you see that as the lesion becomes more ischemic, the frequency of it the frequency of vulnerable plaque is more present in ischemic lesions. So, uh, 
But it looks like the FFR negative lesions have very little vulnerable plaque, but it's an optic illusion of how this graphic is made. Because you look to absolute numbers, these are the absolute numbers. So you mean that two-thirds of these are left beyond. So please remind that when you do FFR, you leave two-thirds of vulnerable plaque untreated. Now the question is, what is the impact of this vulnerable plaque left untreated? The same study shows that actually is double than if you stent it. And it starts already at two years and maintained at five years. I had also the chance to do the combined trial that studied exactly that. What is the chance of a vulnerable plaque giving you symptoms despite being non-ischemic? And we divided it in vulnerable or non-vulnerable just looking at TICFA. And we found that actually if it's a TICFA, as we predicted, gives you five times, sorry, five times more events than when it's not a TICFA. And it's not only us saying this, the impact of TICFA has also been shown from the group of Dr. Akasaka and Dr. Kubo. They showed also that in the non-culprit lesions uh, of the acute coronary syndrome patients, if you have a lipid-rich TICFA, you will have a 33 event rate over a long follow-up. And if you don't have that, you're pretty much stable. So let's look to this actual evidence of ischemic endpoints and the thrombotic endpoints. As you know, what I learned from ischemia trial is that 20% of these people crossed over. And if I look to a Gaussian distribution, where this 20% is, it's exactly at 75, 0.75 FFR, which is not something that we didn't know. We knew that. It's what was originally found out. The DEFAIR trial was done with 0.75, only that we arbitrarily brought it to 0.80. We also know that from the two main trials that studied this, there is a reduction in myocardial infarction at over five years, but the question is why we still have 70% of myocardial infarctions remaining. And maybe these are these two-thirds of vulnerable plaques that we leave beyond. And another important question is which type of vulnerable plaque to follow. And as you could see, as they show also in Japan, you need to follow lipid-rich plaque and TICFA. So it means that you need to have a significant plaque burden plus TICFA. And it's exactly as we also looked. And we want to also step further in our study from combined. It's not only lipid-rich, but it's also lipid-rich TICFA, while the lipid-rich without TICFA gives almost similar re results as fibrotic plaque. And if we look further again, this we have not published yet, but I will try to show you. If we look to TICFA versus non, then TICFA plus MLA, TICFA plus MLA and plaque volume, TICFA plus MLA plaque volume and, and complex plaque, so previous rupture of healed plaque, you could go up from 2.6, what you normally expect from FFR negative lesions, to event rates up to 40%. So there is a clear gradation into this. And therefore, we're thinking, rethinking revascularization, we need to follow the vulnerable plaque, but we also need to follow the very ischemic lesions. So it's a combination of two. We will not stand more, but just select better. We could reduce somehow the burden of uh, cutoff of ischemia and get 15 or 20% of these lesions that have TICFA, which also then treated with OCT will benefit for periprocedural input guidance. And that's why I had the chance to design and run this trial. And that is called the Combined Intervene, which in one arm we, com we look to multivessel patients, ACS and stable, and we combine the FFR uh, negative. Uh, so in one arm we have the FFR guidance, so less than 80 stent, uh, more than 80 you treat. On the other uh, side, we treat the vulnerable plaques and lesions that have an FFR less than 0.75. And if you don't have any of those, you are put on medical treatment. We're treating 1,220 patients. It's also a global trial and uh, in more than 50 sites. And we expect a, a reduction of a primary endpoint with more than 50%. So, if we remove this concept of ischemia exclusivity from revascularization strategy, we end up to enhanced role of non-invasive imaging, absence of symptoms, in, despite absence of uh, symptoms, especially in population subgroups with high risk factors. 
which could lead to early cat lab treatment in intermediate high-risk patients, but also tailored treatment with lipid-lowering medication. And now we have also a very good modalities to identify those plaques in uh, CT. So this new uh, company is uh, CTFFR, but they also do plaque characterization, they also do shear stress, so also they look to vulnerability within plaque, they also look to diameter of stenosis and eventually cup thickness and lipid content. So we could have all this information already before. And then we could give tailored treatment with new lipid-lowering medication, which also can have a further impact into reducing events. We're also coming with combined imaging modalities with potential advantages, like combined OCT and IVUS and NIRS, the combined OCT and IVUS, and also the combined uh, OCT and FFR. So in conclusion, I have to say, you need to give scissor what belongs to scissor. So the FFR remains the best assessment to detect ischemic lesions non-responsive to medical treatment. Other diastolic indices are less accurate but non-inferior and could be valid substitutes for FFR. But everything happens for its reason, and in this reason in what we are dealing with are the vulnerable plaques. So MI and death derive from vulnerable plaque and not from ischemia. Therefore, the vulnerable plaque should be the main target of our treatment if we seek to improve heart endpoints and not just angina. Thank you.